Welcome to Westside Community Church. This is part two in the message series, Even Now It's Not Too Late. Let's join Pastor John Clark as he begins. Okay, so even now, it's not too late. Uh, it's a series that, that I began last week. I don't know how long it'll take. And, and I do believe, as, as I said before, I believe you're here by divine uh, connection. I believe God has us here at right times and right places. And, and today will be powerful. We're talking about uh, one of the three things that these messages have been dealing with. One is responding to rejection. A lot of us have been rejected on this level, on the level between humans. And when you get rejected by somebody, you do uh, one of two things. Uh, and usually when a, when a dog bites you, you either cry and run away or you kick and scream and try to hurt the dog back, right? When bitten, do you bite or do you run away? We're going to talk about responding to rejection. Here's the tough part for a lot of us is, is I, I, I don't struggle so much with rejection from you, but it is a toughie when I feel rejected by God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like you've asked God for something and it is doable under his abilities and he don't do it? And how do you respond when rejected by God? We're going to talk about that today. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come even more. Uh, a second thing that I'm, I've been focusing on and I, and I will next Sunday is dealing with depression. We live in northern Michigan. We will run at some point when fall is done here in mid-January. We'll run at some point when the sun sets uh, and we largely don't see it for 45 to 60 days. There is seasonal depression, which is, a, which is a huge part of northern Michigan living. But I'm, I'm not talking about that so much uh, next Sunday as much as dealing with depression as, as um, it comes to those um, in dark times. And I will share with you uh, partially my own stuff and my own struggle. Uh, and, and it seems even weird to say that, and I'll talk more about that next week, but we'll talk about dealing with depression. And then the third and final thing we'll talk about as we work through this is uh, redefining our faith. A lot of us have to redefine our faith. We have placed God in a box about this big, and we've said, God, you can work in my life as long as it's within these quadrants. God, if you, if you want to do anything in my marriage, do it within these things. God, I've watched you work in the past, and this is how much room I'm going to give you. And if you continue to keep God in this kind of a box... God will be limited, and we need to redefine our faith and say, God, I've taken away the box. You do what you have to do the way you have to do it in my life, and I'll be good. And so we'll be talking about that some today. So today, John chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read about six or seven verses. We'll pray, and we'll jump into his word. I'm going to read uh, verses 5 and 6 from last Sunday, and then my real passage for us today is 17 through 22. So John chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, verse 5 says this, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. Yet when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now down to verse 17. On his arrival, this Jesus, uh, he found that Lazarus had been dead for four days. He's already been in the tomb that long. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Lazarus is dead. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. We're going to spend some time on that verse. When Martha gets to Jesus, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now, even now, with everything that's happened, God will give you whatever you ask. Uh, we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to talk about where you are in response to God. Let's pray. Father, this is good stuff. Uh, I will get out of the way. I got lots of things I'd like to talk about, but it is of no interest to anyone right now. It is only what you have to say. So I will move out of the way. I will allow your Holy Spirit to have complete reign and rule over this, over this uh, next few moments, God, and, and throughout our lives. But, Lord, this is critical. We, we're going to give you 25 minutes here, uh, Lord. And, and, and if you choose for more, we'll give it, we'll give it, we give it. But, Lord, I really do believe that you can move in profound waves. There are hurting people who are at the end of the volume of my voice who desperately need your help today. For those who have been rejected, may they feel received. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. So let me do this. I can't preach last week's message. It's online. You can watch it online. You can get it in the lobby, but I'll just give you a little synopsis. So if you're visiting or you're becoming a part of our family, you can bring up, bring up stuff. Verses 5 and 6, it says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus, and yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two days. Remember last week we talked about this and, and, and how shocking it is 
that, that we have learned as little children on up, if you pray and anything you pray, God will answer it and God will give you what you ask, right? We've all heard that, correct? But we're reading here in John chapter 11 that that is not so. They prayed, they sent word for Jesus to come because Lazarus is sick. This is not Lazarus the unknown guy. This is not Lazarus the loser. This is not Lazarus the crack addict. This is not Lazarus uh, a step cousin or, or whatever. This is Lazarus somebody Jesus loved. And yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed. Jesus stayed where he was two more days. They couldn't even get the attention of Jesus. And, and that's really hard for us to grapple with. But if you've lived any part of your life in connection to God, I promise you, you have had moments where you have called on God and he did not come. What do you do when you call on Jesus and he doesn't come? What do you do when you pray a prayer in faith, believing that God is who he says he is and he doesn't show up for two more days? Or maybe he doesn't show up for five more days. Or maybe he hasn't showed up yet. How do we grapple with that? And so we talked about that last Sunday. And if you remember, here's the key. What do you do when, when you call for Jesus and he doesn't come? Is to realize that largely we are determining things according to our course of action. Remember, boxing God in. He fits into these, uh, the, these parts of my life in this way. And God, when I pray, you come. That's your job. Like a dog in the yard, Jesus is supposed to respond to our prayers. And he does for the most part. But there are times when he doesn't do it. And we discovered in verse 4 that one of the reasons why he doesn't is it's not about us. It's really about him. He did not send us here so that he could serve us, but we are here so we could serve him. And more importantly, verse 4 says that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The reality is, is it's not so important to pray what is best for me, God, but what will bring you the most glory. And see, that's, we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle because we, we really have some needs. One of the struggles we have is, is, is it me, God? Is, is the reason why you didn't answer my prayer is because I didn't do enough? Is it because I didn't give enough? Is it because I didn't care enough? God, what is it? Is it because my family hasn't always been Christians? God, is it because I haven't been in church in a while and that's why you didn't answer my prayers? And we have all these questions that, that, that we believe are the reasons why God didn't answer. There's others who pray, God, I did give enough, and God, I did serve enough, and God, I did care enough, and I have served you faithfully for years, Jesus, and I called for you to answer one prayer, which you have answered a prayer like that before, and you have come to it, you've answered it, but this time I called for you and you didn't do it, and we literally stand with our arms out saying, what in the world is going on? Is that Jesus? Whose phone's going off? Seriously, I am ADD. Do I, am I only hearing things in my head? Did anybody else hear the phone go off? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Call, if it's Jesus, ask if he's going to make it here before lunch. Does he want to go to the house? What, is he going to come over? Okay, stay focused. Okay, so we stand with our, in our living rooms almost confounded for the fact that God didn't answer the prayer that, that, that we gave up to him. And the reality is, remember, it's not about us, it's about him. And what will glorify God the most is what matters and so that was where we were last week. So this week, let's jump into verses 17, 18, and 19. It says, on his arrival, Jesus arrives, and he found out that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. You talk about showing up late. Four days Lazarus has been dead. Do you remember where Jesus is in perspective? He's on the other side of the Jordan. From that Jordan River to Bethany is less than 20 miles. It takes six hours to get from there to Bethany. And Jesus is somewhere around two to six days late. Lazarus is dead, and it says that, that uh, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And so many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. I, I want you not to, not to slide by this. I got, I, got to, I got to walk through this for a minute. Give me two minutes, and we'll move on. But, but these verses are critical. One is, and, and stay with me on this is that often we will pray to God, and I'm talking about rejection here for a moment, okay? We will often ask God to, to do a miracle in our life or, or just something simple. We ask him to answer a prayer, right? We pray to him, God, I really need you to come through for me. And, and you've given him some time, right? Just like Jesus was given time by Mary and Martha, they had two days while Lazarus was sick. He was, he was still sick. I don't believe that Jesus left uh, the Jordan River area until Lazarus had died. 
He wanted to, he, he, and part of the process of what God is doing here is he wants to make sure when he performs a miracle, and by the way, if you don't ever come back to Westside, I want to tell you something. He does raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus does come back. Nothing stops God from accomplishing what will glorify God the most. And so I want you to know that, but, but in this moment, they don't know that. And so they prayed, Lord, you got two days. Lazarus is, is getting weak, and, and Jesus doesn't come. That's heavy, right? I mean, I mean, when he's had the perfect opportunity to answer, you ever pray for your rent? You ever, you ever pray that the car starts? You ever pray that your daughter calls? You ever pray that, that, the, that, that the friend of the court meeting will, will stop the proceedings? You ever, you ever pray that, that God has more than ample opportunities? The tests are not results, will not be in for 72 hours, for, so Jesus has got time before we find out if it's malignant or benign. He's got time because the surgery is not until Friday. He's got time because the doctor said in 72 hours we'll know for sure whether it was positive or negative. He's got time because the doctor said if we can get to the 14th week, we won't miscarry this time. He's got time to make it because um, the, the promotion is due on Friday and I find out whether I get the job or I lost it. He's got time because I put the bid in and we'll know by Monday whether or not I get it. He's got time, right? Have you ever been there? Have you ever prayed, oh God, you got plenty of time. Well, Jesus had time. He had two days. But then Lazarus dies. Now, for a lot of us, when Lazarus dies, there feels like a finality to it, doesn't it? It feels like it's over. Lazarus, he's dead. But, but Mary and Martha have not given up hope. No, because you've got to understand something culturally. It ain't over. It's not the midnight hour, but it is the 11th hour. We've got one time out left. We've used two, but we've still got some time to change the game. And so the Scripture tells us that, that it's specific, that, that, that Lazarus has been dead for four days. Do you think that the writers of the Bible just toss stuff in there for fun? Did anybody think that way? They don't. By the way, it, it doesn't happen. You're good students. You nobody raised their hand. Nobody's like, I got to go pee though. Four days. It's, it's critical. John wants you to know that Lazarus has already been dead for four days. You want to know why that's so important? There was a group of rabbinical priests of that day and age who believed and began to taught that the spirit does not leave the body of a dead person for at least three days, for 72 hours. The spirit remains in the body of a dead person for 72 hours. Next Sunday, when I talk about depression, I will walk you through what it would be like to have a deceased relative and what Mary and Martha would have been exposed to and how traumatic this event would have been for them. I don't have time today. You'll have to come back next week. But, but the spirit remains in the body for three days. But how, when does Jesus come to Bethany? On day what? Four. Now, so for Mary and Martha, even though the rent is due, the tests are coming, we got to make it to next weekend, they don't begin to weep and mourn yet, even though Lazarus dies, because they got three days. The spirit is still in Lazarus. And as a matter of fact, the tomb was left open, just waiting for Jesus to come. Day one goes by, he's not there. Day two goes by, he's not there. Day three goes by, he's not there. And finally now, day four strikes, and all hope is gone. We've used our last time out. All possibilities have been, have been, have been uh, taken advantage of. We've, we've exhausted all of our resources. There is no plan B now for him. And so when John writes, it's four days, he wants you to know that for Mary and Martha, they have no other option but to believe God has failed them and they take it personal do you know what's even worse is the next line in verse 18 and 19 when it says and many Jews came to comfort Mary and Martha how much more is there salt in the wound for them when Jesus who loves them and knows them and has been with them before he don't show he don't send one of his disciples he doesn't send a note he doesn't text he doesn't email he doesn't call but people they don't even know Jews from Jerusalem made their way to Mary and Martha's house to give their condolences Jesus does not make the viewing he does not make the funeral he does not make the graveside service and so in large part, they feel deeply rejected by God. Now, I know that's pretty heavy for a lot of you. That when you begin to grapple with the emotions of, how do I respond when I've been rejected by God? Now, not all of us have ever been rejected by God, by the way. I know some of you are in here, and you've never had 
a prayer that you've prayed that hasn't been answered. I praise God for you. So you ought to listen carefully to the rest of us as we talk this through. Because there are times when we feel like God had ample time to answer our prayers and he didn't, so what do we do? So here's verse 20, probably my favorite verse. This can't be your life verse, by the way. Uh, it doesn't work as a life verse. So some of you are highlighting and saying, oh, I love this verse. This is good stuff. It's not that kind of verse. You don't write this at the bottom of a birthday card to someone that you're wishing happy birthday. It's not a get well card you send to your grandmother, okay? But here's verse 20. Verse 20 says this. It says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. There it is, verse 20. It, it seems simple, but if you know anything about women, and by the way, I know nothing about women, okay? I am not about to step into those waters because women, you are amazing, okay? And that's the best word I could use. I, I, I know, because Jeff, you said to me at the door, crazy is one of the words you use when I said women, but I said amazing. Uh, and and uh, I just step back here in case any of there's flying objects, so. There's something to be learned about women. I don't protest to know everything, but I like this line. This is the National Enquirer of, of all verses in the Bible. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. It is, it is the diversity of two decisions of what happens when Jesus finally arrives. Six days, it's over. Lazarus is dead. There's no hope, no chance. And then Jesus shows up. Jesus comes, now here's, my, here's what I love about this. I want to ask you a question, is how do you respond to rejection? How do you normally respond to rejection? There's usually one of two ways, and I'll describe those to you. And we see them in this one verse. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Um, um, verse 30 tells us that Jesus didn't get to the front door of their house. No, Jesus didn't get to the driveway. No, Jesus didn't even get within the village limits of Bethany. Verse 30 says, as Jesus was about to enter the village of Bethany, Martha met him. <laughs> are, you, are you following this? Martha is not bringing a cup of cocoa, okay? Gee, how you doing? Oh, good to see you. Don't oh, hug me. You know, that's not what Martha's going for. She went out to meet him. Uh, you, you ever get in trouble with your mom as a child and you run out of the house and you make your mom chase you? Distance does not make the heart grow fonder when your mother's chasing you when you've been bad. It only infuriated my mother. My mother would pick up sticks and metal bars along the way to find me. And it didn't make it so. So Martha is making her way to Jesus. I just love this. And here's the deal. One of the ways you respond to rejection is face it. Martha was going to go out and face Jesus. You can see it right there. She went out of her mind. She went out of town. She was going to go out of control. She went out to meet him. And I love this. I imagine, have you ever had those moments when you're walking down the street and someone goes running by and they shout something out? You know, you, you barely hear it. Did he say earthquake? Did he say hurricane as he ran by? You ask your friend. Like, I don't know. I couldn't hardly hear it. Same thing happens. The disciples are about to enter Bethany, and a servant goes running by. Martha's coming. And as he runs by, he yells it out. <laughs> you know, Martha's coming. And, and in that moment, I imagine the disciples were all trying to figure out what to do, you know. I imagine John took his pen out and a piece of paper. This is going to be good. <laughs> I'm going to get every word she says. Ooh, this is sweet. And then, and then I can see, I can see uh, Judas, you know, just taking wagers. I got five on Jesus. I got five on Jesus. Who's got me? Who's got, who's got Martha? Who's got my Six on Martha, six on Martha. I got seven on Martha, seven on Martha. Five on Jesus, five on Jesus, six on Martha. You know, they're taking wagers. Judas is trying to make some cash on the side. I can see Matthew and Bartholomew like, why don't you guys run ahead? We'll stay here with the donkeys, man. We'll be cool. Just go ahead. Go ahead. I've seen her tick before. I'll tell you what. Go ahead. Do you remember in Luke chapter 10 when she got mad at her sister? She came to Jesus and said, hey, can you tell her to get up and get some work done? Because Martha is a busybody, and she's going to be busy on Jesus now. And so here, here's the deal. And then I see Peter. I see Peter in my mind. He walks up beside Jesus just standing there like, so what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> I'm not telling you what to do, Jesus, but if you can call on 10,000 angels, this is a dang good time to do it. Because Martha's not happy. Martha's going out of her mind and she's coming to face it. Is that how you respond to rejection? I mean, when rejected, do you want to reject back? When bitten, do you want to bite back? I mean, I mean, some of us are fighters, man. You, you mess with us. You offend me, I'm going to offend you. You call my sister a name, I'm calling your mom a name, you know. And, and we just stepping up, right? And so, so Martha has gone out. When she heard Jesus 
was coming, she went out to meet him. She didn't like fuss about the house. See, we put new doilies out on the, in the end table. Get some tea, mate. Jesus is coming. She's like, Jesus is coming? Heck no. She slammed the door and she's out after him. I'll go give him some peace of my mind. You ever been there? You ever been rejected? I, I've told part of this story before, but the truth was, there was a time when, when I, I largely felt like I needed to respond. If you offended me or rejected me, I had words for you. I just, I wasn't afraid to just, uh, just let you know. And so, so back in the, uh, the, the summer of 2001, I was working with a church across town, and, and the idea had come up to plant this church in Petoskey. I'd been a youth pastor. I'd, I'd never started a church, and, and yet they had this idea, and I thought, man, this is a God thing. And so I, I, every spare hour, I would go up to Petoskey, an hour and a half north, and I would go to the hospital and, and, and to the gas station and to the pharmacy and wherever, and I would talk to people, and I would say, hey, if a church was up here in the Petoskey area, and you had a pastor like me, would you come to town, and would you come to see it? And they'd run away, and... But then I would calm down, you know, and I would act normal. And they say, yeah, we would like a church like that. We want a church. And, and, and as a matter of fact, we put an ad in the newspaper. And 75 people showed up to the, uh, to the high school auditorium just to hear me pitch this vision of a church in, in, in the area of Petoskey. People loved Matter of fact, we, we had a building reserved. And we had finances raised. And my wife had agreed, let's go to Petoskey to plant a church. We never want to do anything like this before. But God was on our side. Good times were ahead. And then I showed up to a board meeting on a Sunday night at this church, only to hear 10 other men announce that there was not going to be a church plant in Petoskey. It was canceled. Canceled. Are you serious? There was a break. I believe God knew what he was doing. I think God took a time out in that board meeting. I have to take a time out right here. Let me give my client and pull him aside. There was a time out and I was out in the hallway and I'm pacing back and forth. And in my mind, I'm going back and forth on what I'm gonna say. One thing I'm gonna say is, I don't believe there's a collective enough brain cells among the 10 men there to fill a Dixie cup. How in the world are you gonna make a decision? They wanna know what I have to say, I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna come all out on them. And I'm just ranting and raving. And I'd gone down man for man of what I was gonna say. Oh, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna, you know, that was, uh, I'm just cheering myself on. Let them have it, man. You know, you can't swear in church, but I can draw pictures for them, okay? I can describe to them what part of the donkey I view them to be, and I can, I can help them. And, and so I just wanted to, I just, you know it says a double entendre. Okay, so I just want to keep working that out. And just as I turned to go down the hallway, a good friend of mine, name was Mark, he reached out. He didn't really grab me, he just put his hand on my arm, and he said, hey, dude, how you doing? And I go, not good. <laughs> and he kind of let go of my arm, and I turned to walk back in the room. And he says to me, as I'm walking away, Probably one of the most profound things I ever heard. He said, John, have you ever considered that nothing comes to you that hasn't first passed through the loving hands of God? I'll never forget hearing those words because, I mean, I was ticked. I had been rejected. Nobody asked me what I thought. Nobody came to me to get my opinion. Nobody knew how much time I had spent. Nobody cared to find out the, 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 the enormous uh, sacrifice it would take to do this. Nobody considered me. And then Mark's words were, John, have you ever considered that nothing comes to you that hasn't first passed through the loving hands of God? And those words of peace stopped me dead in my tracks. And I began to realize that maybe it wasn't about me. Maybe I was not the most important subject here. Just maybe these men who God has assembled in leadership knew something I didn't know. Maybe what I felt as a personal rejection could very well have passed through the hands of a loving God getting to me so God could do the next thing. But see, for me, if I was the most important uh, character in this story, I would have never heard his words. But there they were. Maybe there is a God and maybe he doesn't mean me harm. And so I never went in that room and chewed anybody out. I never said a thing. I humbly took it and I watched what God did. Almost a year from that date, ironically, this thing called West Side Community Church started in the upstairs of our house about nine years ago. And I am so glad we did not go to Petoskey.
I don't think there's anything good in Petoskey. But anyways, um, <laughs> see, I wonder how many of us want to go out and face it when we're rejected. I mean, you want to get in somebody else's face. Martha went out to meet Jesus. I wonder how many of us have gone out of our minds and it just may very well be that God had something he was doing on the side. You see, we always want what we think's best for us, but maybe what the key is what brings him the most glory. You understand? Why maybe we ought to just set back and let God be God. But, but that's not the only rejection that we see as I kind of get to the end here. i got 10 minutes. Uh, th- th- is, is Mary. It says, but Mary stayed at home. Now, this one interests me the most. And these five words I'm going to work with you on next week. We're going to go through these uh, pretty in, in depth. It only seems simple, but Mary stayed at home. But can I say to you, when faced with rejection, Martha faced it, but Mary stayed away. Mary stayed at home. Maybe that's how you respond to rejection. Do you, do you stay away? I mean, when rejected, do you like shut off the phone? You cancel your Facebook? You, you, you discontinue responding to emails and texts? Do you find yourself offended by one person in a group of eight people and because that one person has rejected you, offended you, you shut yourself out from the other seven because you just assume they're all against you? And the next thing you find yourself doing is being all alone, all by yourself, and you shut yourself off off from relationships. You stayed away. Mary stayed at home. And part of the reason why you stay away, right, is because you say to yourself, I'm not safe enough to be around right now. If they ever show up here, I may say some things I can't take back, so you choose to stay away. And maybe that's best for everyone else. And so Mary stayed at home. I mean, for Mary, I mean, you know, she's She's just as ticked as Martha is. Martha may have, uh, may have the guts to go out and face Jesus, but Mary's just as angry. I mean, I, I can see Mary mumbling under her breath. Ain't no perfume for Jesus today. I ain't shedding one tear for him. Ain't pulling my hair down to wipe his feet. He's getting no kisses from this Mary today. You just see it, don't you? She stayed at home, but I also see in Mary this... Um, this tragic brokenness, though, too. I see in Mary the, 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 the crushing weight of rejection. I mean, Martha hears that Jesus is coming. Do you think that Martha just walked out the door and didn't say something to Mary? Do you think that's possible? These two girls, have been, all they got is each other. And a, and a bunch of strangers mourning their brother's death. These two girls, when, when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, i got to imagine that Martha walked over to her sweet sister and said, Mary, Jesus is on his way, do you want to go talk to him? And I can almost see Mary just shaking her head. Mm -mm. Because there's just too much pain connected to being rejected. I mean, it's heavy, I mean, when you stop and think about it, but is that how you respond to it? I mean, are you prone to responding to Jesus when rejected or to God by staying away? Are you prone to do that with other people? Can I say to you that neither one is healthy, neither one is the best choice to make. Both are too extreme, but somewhere in the middle, what you got to start doing, folks, is you got to start trusting that God is who he says he is, and God is on the throne, and God will care for you. God will watch over you. It is not your job to rule the roost and be sheriff of the entire community. It is not your job to be the recluse and, and, and start a monastery in your home as you shut yourself off. It is your job to stay steady with it and trust Trust that he is God. So he didn't answer your prayer the way you wanted him to. He didn't come through for you the way you begged him for. He didn't respond the way you needed him to. But does it change the fact that he's still God? No, he's still God. I think the wisdom of my friend might be well worth our consideration that nothing comes to us that hasn't first passed through the loving hands of God. That doesn't mean that some of the things that you face won't hurt. It doesn't mean that some of the things that you'll go through won't still cause you sleepless nights, but it does mean that there still is a God. I, I, I need to wrap up today. I want to go to verse 21 real quick. Verse 21 says that, that, that when Martha gets to Jesus, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, this is Martha. Remember, Martha's expressing herself. This is all that John pens, right? This is all he writes down. 
Really, Martha used 11 or 12 words. That's all she said when she got to Jesus. John probably just did the, you know, the abbreviated version. Wow, I cannot write those kind of words on this piece of paper. I don't know. I don't want to degrade Martha by any means. But you get the idea. She meets Jesus on the outskirts of town. And maybe that's all that she had to say in the first statement. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. I mean, don't you hear the heaviness of the pain in her heart when she says it? Don't you hear somewhat of anguish? I really hear somebody who's been hurt deeply, but I also hear something else. Not only does she say, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She is saying, if you had only cared enough, if you had only loved me enough. I wonder how many uh, of us have used, if you had God. If you had only been here, if you had only done this, how many times have you called out to God in anguish and anger, almost confronting him face to face and saying, if you had only loved me enough, if you had only been here for my husband, if you had only been in the vehicle, they wouldn't have died. If you had only knew how much a child meant to me, if you had only understood that the raise was necessary, if you had only allowed the business to stay open, if you had only done this miracle, and we do that in our lives. And so some of us, and listen carefully, have said some very strong things to God in our prayers and we view some if onlys some of us have kind of made a, a line in the sand between us and God and I, um, I wonder how many of us are struggling today even to say John I don't think there's a chance anymore for me and God is that you? I mean do you feel like there may not be a door open for you yet? I mean is it possible that You've been considering that you've burned so many bridges. I mean, you've cut things off between you and God that there, there's no way back. I mean, John, it's not even worth me even trying to listen to any more of what you have to say because I've said some things to God that has uh, severed the relationship. I can't even repeat them, things I've called out to him. And because I felt rejected by him, I don't believe it's even possible for me to get back to him. And that, my friends, is a lie. Because look at what Martha says, 11 words, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It looks like it's anger. It looks like it's resentment. It looks like it's final. It looks like she's closed the door. But look carefully. Do you see it? Look carefully. There's something there that maybe, maybe it's in you. Maybe it's also in you because you made some things final. But look at it carefully. The first word, if. There's two letters, an I and an F, but I see the F, and, and that, that alarmed me when I first saw it. The, the next word is had. There's an H and a, and a D, but in the middle there's an A. Look at it. See? It's not easy to find when you first see it. Go to the last word, died. There's a, there's a letter I. Pull that one out. And then in brother, there's seven letters, but the middle one is the T. Pull that one out. And then the word have. We, we take the H from there, and if you look close enough, what you find in the 11 words, that sounds like Martha's done. It sounds like Martha's given up. It sounds like Martha no longer wants the relationship. It sounds like Martha says, I'm out. And yet what I see and what I find is that Martha still has some faith. And I bet you any money, if you'll look carefully at what you have said, I bet you there's still some faith. Is there? Is, is there a chance that you still believe that he is God. I'm begging you, think about it. Stop. I mean, I know you've said some things, but, but is it possible that he's still God? Do you have faith to believe that he can still do a miracle? Andy, will you come? we got to wrap up. The last verse, verse 22 says, but I know, listen to Martha. She goes on, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. I, do you see that? Look at her faith. She says, but I know. Can I ask you, what do you know? Listen to me as we wrap up. What do you know? She says, but I know. I love that because that's really where it starts for us. Our faith may be meager and it may come from here and it may come from there and it may be borrowed there and it may be, it may be on loan here, but we pick and, and, we, and we put it together and, and then it, it, there's still some faith. It ain't much, but it's enough to say, but I know. What do you know? Do you know that God loves you still? Seriously, stop and think. Do you know that? Do you know that he still loves you? Do you know that the reason why he didn't answer your prayer the way you wanted him to was not because he doesn't care? It's because he cares so much that he couldn't answer it the way you wanted him to. Do you know that? 
Do you know how much his heart breaks that you've turned your back and walked away in disgust? He, he would move heaven and earth if he could to absolutely change the way you feel about him. Do you know that? I mean, we're talking about a God who sends his son to die. Jesus is going to die for our sins. And in this moment, as Martha confronts Jesus, she sees in his eyes, I know some things. You don't mean me harm, do you? The same Jesus she was talking to that she knew things about is the one you and I pray to. I'm challenging you today. Dig deep, find the faith to believe and to know some things about him. He's still God. She says, even now, I love this. This is where the title comes from. Even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She said that to Jesus, but I'm saying it to you today. You need to know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Even now. It's, it's past the two-day mark when he was sick. It's past the three-day mark when, when the spirit's still in the body. It's on day four. But even now. My God can still do miracles. Even now, it's not too late. I believe, I know some things about God. And even now, the relationship that's been severed, the money that is gone, the business that is closed, the ministry door that hasn't been opened, the child who hasn't called, even now, it's not too late. Because why? you got to know who God is. God loves us too much. I'm not about to give up on God because he has not given up on us. I've been there where the prayers haven't been answered, but I'm telling you right now, I know. Even now, it's not too late. Listen, what else can you do? Really, are you going to stay away? How's that working for you? Come back to Jesus. Come back to, turn back to Jesus. Seriously, what else can you do? Oh, I'm so glad he's never given up on us. And I'm not going to give up on him. I'm telling you right now, folks, he loves us. Here's the deal. Our prayers have to be like this. Jesus, I pray for the faith to move ahead. To let go of the past. We've hung on to some things we've got to just let go of, folks. And to see me the way that you do. Lord, I pray that I would see myself the way you do, that you, you do, you care intimately for me. And so in that, I turn to you, Jesus. I mean, what else can I do? What else can I do but turn to you? Do not leave here this morning without turning to Jesus, folks. Oh, his love goes on and on and on. So for me, I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to go to Jesus can't find it on my own I didn't find it when I chewed him out but I see it here today turn to Jesus thanks for joining us at Westside Community Church we hope to see you next week at our 9 or 11 a.m. service or our evening service at 7 p.m.